Hello. So you're Hello. back. You're I'm back. back. And we're here with the brother and the sister, the brother and sister show, a.k.a. the BS show. Yay. Yeah, we still need a name for this show, but since Becky hasn't come up with a good one, we're calling it the BS show for now. We might go ahead and crowdsource that. So if you can do better than BS, send us a line on Twitter via email. Let us know. It'll be showy McShowface if we ask the internet to come up <laughs> with it. <laughs> Still better than the BS show. So yeah, I'll take actually, it. yeah. <laughs> Good. So Good. today, what we're going to talk about, we step back. Last time we talked about generally um, the, the languages you need for translation and specifically about how you got started in translation and, you know, being multilingual and what that brings to the table and so the sort of language side of things. But today what we want to do is start talking about the business side of things and that's going to be the main focus from here on out. So assuming, you know, you've got the translation side down, the business side, how do you get started and then how do you build your audience and, and that's the general theme we're going to take Today, specifically, what's your go-to market? How, how do you really get started and get out there? How do you structure your approach? Because um, you need structure to make things happen. And um, you, of course, have spoken and written in the past about the AIDA approach. Um, so that's what I'd like to focus on today. So why don't you start by giving us a general introduction to the AIDA approach, as in a go-to market approach, not to be confused with the Verdi captured in Egypt Right. Music approach to life. AIDA is something that might sound a bit subjective, as in it's a school subject, and so it might sound a bit theoretical and not practical. It might sound like something, you know, you learn in a textbook and then you forget. But I always found it interesting, A, because it kind of worked for me, and B, because I feel like it's one of those tactics that the big boys use, you know, the big consulting firms and marketing firms, and I figured if we're going to market ourselves as freelance translators, why not do it well? And I see too many people do it haphazardly and kind of try this, that, and the other, and um, just to see what, what works, what doesn't, and I feel like if there's more structure, then it can work out well. So AIDA, uh, what does it stand for? If you haven't learned about it, you might have already heard about it when watching Glengarry Glenn Ross right before ABC Always Be Clothing, you see AIDA written on the blackboard. And um, so, well, and so what does it stand for? The A-I-D-A, A stands for attention or awareness. I, I stands for interest. D stands for desire. Desire. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, a, and the final A stands for action. So just to go through them, and, uh, the first A, which stands for attention or awareness, means basically you want to get in front of the potential client. You want to get in their face. You want to be seen by them. Because if they don't see you, nothing else matters. And so if they're looking for a translator, you want to be there. In your case, if someone's looking for librarians who don't go to libraries or stuff like that, then you, they, you want them to see you. And uh, so you need to be able to get to be part of their attention span, let's say. And you need to find a way to do that. And... So whatever that might mean for you, if you're online, it means to have an online presence. If you want to be in certain portals or if, you, if this means networking or, if, or whatever it might mean for you, just to be there, to be available, to be visible to them in, uh, in some way or another. The second letter is I, interest. And so right when you've grabbed their attention, you want to focus on the benefits that you can give them. You want to make them interested in you. And this means that you need to focus on them. So don't focus on yourself, what features you, ha you can provide or what or all the awesome stuff you're able to do or you've done in your life or anything. No, just focus on them. If they need a certain translation done, a legal translation from Italian to English, that's all you need to focus on. Don't tell them that you also do French or this and that. You can mention that later after on, you know, after you can mention that later after you're done with this job, let's say. But you want to focus on how you can make their life easier with the mentality, I can do this for you so you don't have to worry about it anymore. There, I just made your life easier. Boom, they're interested. You need to pique their interest, and so you need to focus on that letter, on I, on interest. So, and once you've done that, so you have A, you got their attention, then now they're interested in you. At this point, you have to convince them 
that you are the one they want. You have to make yourself the obvious choice. And I like to think of trying to make myself the no-brainer choice. Like they would be f foolish not to hire me in a way because I got their attention, they're interested in me, and at this point the, there will there'll be some tweak or some change or some way to express it that shows that I'm the obvious choice. Maybe I can do, I can do Italian to English uh, translation, you know, a legal translation. And so here I show, look, I have all the experience you need and more, and I can do it within your timeline or faster, and my price is just as good or better as anything else you'll find. You know, so suddenly they have no reason not to hire you. And so if you can focus on that, and this might also just mean also being in a good mood, you know, and, and uh, showing that you're a nice person. And if you can do that, then, then you've succeeded in making them desire you, right? And that brings me yes. to the final A, which is action. And at that point, they need to take action. At that point, they need to hire you. So you want to make it as easy as possible for them to hire you. So you don't want them to have to jump through too many hoops. If you're using a portal like Pros or anything like that, just make it very easy. Because too often, I have dealt with translators and I've worked with translators who say stuff like, oh, I need to be paid by check by mail, or I need to make sure I'm paid within 24 hours of completing the job, or some, something along those lines. And you really don't want to do that. You want to invest time and effort into making it easy for them to hire you. You know, have as few steps as possible, as few impediments as possible in having them hire you. And so you want to make the action that they have to take at the end as easy as possible. That was about it. That's, yeah, great. So the, again, going back to the general theme of AIDA and why you would use something like this, um, because as you say, we're talking to freelancers here. So, you know, the ultimate small business and, and you're right. What do we learn from the large corporations? And I, I feel like a lot of, I feel like I, I don't like that expression, but anyway, it's, it's, one often feel gets away. the impression that, um, uh, that small businesses, freelancers, they enter a market thinking, I'm on my own, I can sort of do whatever I want, I can experiment, and with this approach, I'm just going to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And actually, I think the smaller your operation, then the less ability you have to do that. Because a large corporation, you know what, they've got resources that go on and on and on, and they can make mistakes, and, and they can get it wrong, and it's still not good business practice, but they will notice those effects less. And if you're on your own, you want more structure. And so, you know, as you said at the very beginning, you do want to go and find a detailed approach. And in fact, spoiler alert, later on in this series when we talk about books, um, that's going to be the, the, uh, um, the focus or the general theme of, all of the books that we talk about is actually all about bringing structure to your work life and approach. Um, so it's, it is extremely important. And if you're doing this as a freelancer, you know, listen to this, think about how you move your clients through that journey um, and stay very focused. So you're not reinventing the wheel every time. Um, so that's my two cents on the general approach of AIDA. Going back to the stages. So we're talking about different stages. Of course, when you're dealing with your client base, different people will be at different stages of that. So, you know, you're going to be dealing with um, the attention side with this audience, but the desire side with these other people. So... Am I right? So you actually, it's not like you are taking yourself through the AIDA journey. You're taking your desired market, your prospects and your clients through that journey. Right. Yeah, exactly. So every, each, each and every client you should see, you should be right. As, as you put it much better than I'm putting it. Um, you, so each one of those clients should have this AIDA process. And exactly. If in one of them you're in the desire section, but then with another one, you're just grabbing their attention. You have to see it as that and not, not the focus on yourself, but on them. You're right. So when you're setting this up for yourself, you would have, would you recommend having a plan, almost like a one page marketing plan, so to speak, um, where, you know, you know what you're doing, the attention phase, you know what you're doing, the interest phase. And so when you are dealing with any given prospect, you know exactly, you know, you can say, okay, this person is, is at this point of my funnel. Um, and so this is what I want to be talking about with them. Yeah, and actually that could help. I never had anything like that, but it could help to be more structured. The only issue there is that clients can be very different. And for some of them, it could take a month to go through that process. For another one, it could take 20 minutes. 
And so yeah. you really need to cater it to each client. Some of the mm -hmm. clients, you know, th they'll find you on pros and they need someone right away. And so right yeah. away, they're going to look through the main things that are important to them, maybe experience and price and something like that. And they'll be like, okay, that's it. You know, or it's between you and one other person, you know, by when can you have it done or something like that. And so there you need to be very quick and maybe skip a step or two because, you know, you already have their interest. And so, you know, you can, you can skip ahead. Other ones, again, you know, I've dealt with clients who I've been in talks with them for months before I get hired and, you know, they're being very careful or maybe aren't really sure what they want or how they want it yet. And so, yeah, you can get a lot more detailed. I do think it could help to have a cheat sheet, if you will, with all the steps and then to make sure, especially when it gets more detailed, that you've covered all the steps that need to be covered along that process. Yeah. And that's a good point because uh, different people will, you will um, interact with different people at different stages of their buyer journey. And as you say, different buyers perform different buyer journeys. So you need to be able to know where you're entering that conversation when that first conversation happens. And as you say, it might be the awareness and you're going through that journey, but it might be already the action point when they have a job and they need somebody to do it. And it's like, give me the action. How do I hire you? Um, and or why should I hire you? And then how? So knowing, recognizing that is important and recognizing that not all clients are the same is important. And again, the more structure you have, then it easier it is to adapt your approach to the different clients and situations. I um, concur. The, no, good. We're all in agreement. Uh, so going back, uh, just a, a little bit more detail on each stage. Um, attention, um, and you gave the introduction at the beginning, attention or awareness. This is where you let people know that you exist and you're not necessarily selling at this stage. Is that right? Right. And again, it can depend because each client is different. Of course. But at this point, technically speaking or theoretically speaking, I should say, you just want them to know you exist. Exactly. You're not selling anything. You're just showing that you're there and know that you're visible to them. Mm -hmm. and, and again, going on in the series in the, in the very near future, um, our next or, or second to next video is going to be more about how you do that. So we'll come back and focus on that today. We're just, we're sticking to the broader structure. Um, so you let people know that you're there, the various methods for doing this, and then you have, um, once you've created awareness, you create interest. What's the difference between interest and awareness? This can depend how you approach a client. If you're at a networking event, then the, the attention at the beginning or awareness is what you will focus most of your time on because you'll be telling people, hi, I'm a freelance translator. Hi, how are you doing? I do translations. Hi, how's it going? If you're meeting people face-to-face, -face, I find that attention takes longer. While when you're online, people usually find you because they already are looking for someone who can do translation. So you, you grab their attention right away, and right away you're going to go on to interest. Awareness is purely awareness, and it might mm -hmm. seem a bit simplistic, but it's really just being there, you know, and yeah. this also includes letting your friends know on Facebook and everything that you're a translator. And it happens all the time that people say, oh, you know, everyone knows I'm a translator, everyone knows I'm a translator, but then they have friends who have contacted someone else to do translations rather than them because they didn't think of it at that moment. So you want to make sure that you are visible. I don't mean bother all your friends, you know, constantly bombarding them, letting them know that you have translation services available, but you do want to make sure that you come to mind with mm -hmm. your friends, with um, colleagues, with people you meet at networking events, et cetera, et cetera. And interest is when they can actually use your services and you want them to be interested in you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so I think part of it is be aware of your context um, and, and, and the, uh, the awareness side, I, that's, that's so true and it's so important because we think we tell people, by the way, I'm a freelance translator, you know, if anything ever comes up and then something's going to come up in 18 months and the, your friend that you told that to is going to be in a business mindset and they're not going to be thinking of you because they're in business and um, and it's true finding ways to maintain awareness so the the a is not necessarily a one-off thing it's an ongoing thing it's, it's not just creating attention I think but holding somebody's attention in a non-invasive in a non-annoying way right yeah and many times it can be a challenge because how do you do that? You might contact a bunch of people who don't need a translator now but only need one in six months to a year or something like that. How can you maintain their attention without constantly annoying them with emails right. or whatever? Definitely, definitely. And I know, for example, in, um, in my software 
day job life, you know, one thing we do is we just go to conferences a lot and we exhibit. And if we don't exhibit, then I just go because it's one way of just reminding people always we're there, we're there, we're there. And that's what social media can do for you, for example. And there are a lot of um, different ways to, to do that. And again, we'll get into more detail in, in future episodes. Um, and, and that does, and I think hopefully we have described the difference between the awareness and the interest. And interest, it seems to me, is you're entering, and again, to go into um, sales speak, but you're entering that funnel at that point. There's, there's, you're, you're on a sales journey, whereas, as you say, awareness could be a one-off or it could just go over numerous months before you enter a sales process. Um, and so interest then leads to desire. So when it comes to desire, that's where you are really selling yourself. Is that right? I mean, yeah, that's, it. that's exactly what you're doing. The way I always see it is I'm trying to make myself an obvious choice to them. And then pretty straightforward action is hire me. And the important thing there is, is what you said before, make it easy. You know, don't, you know, don't say I only get paid by check. Don't make it difficult for somebody to pay you. That's, yeah. that's, that should be a no-brainer. But it's true. I'm amazed, you know, how many people put all these stipulations on getting paid or, you know, or getting hired even, you know, well, you have to fill in my form, which is five pages long so that you can hire me, you know, don't create obstacles, right? So just create an action that is very simple and makes it easy for people to hire you. Right. Is that right? Yeah. No. And, and I see this both ways because I, I've, uh, I've been in touch with other translation agencies that when they try to hire freelancers, they want them to deliver everything by, you know, by mail and by post, even yeah. if they have translators all over the world. And they, and it, it seems odd that people keep doing that. But no, you want to make it easy. And it, I don't see why you would create extra steps and make it harder for people to pay you or to hire you at this stage. Yeah. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Something to think about. Um, a side note for those who are seeing this on video, the sun is coming up outside my window and that's why there are slashes of light across my face. Um, that's the sun coming through my blinds. Um, I know. And it's, it's, they've been getting brighter and brighter. Also, I hope you're right. not watching on video because I'm holding my mic up rather oddly. This is true. So most of you are not watching on video, but just in case that does occur, um, I'm not turning into a monster. Um, that's just, that's the sun. It's a but good thing. If you are watching it on video, now you can see my nose get larger if I do this. This is true. We're, <laughs> we're, we're sticking okay. to this theme of the throughout. Nose, yes. For those of you who've entered the title competition, if you want to work that in, go ahead. Internet. Um, um, Internet. Okay. Sorry. Good. So that so we've walked you through. We've given you the why the Aida approach. We've walked you through the various steps of the Aida approach. Um, in conclusion, the Aida approach is something that you have used and has worked well for you. Yes. Yes. Um, I am a big fan of having structure, and as I said at the beginning, the smaller you are, the more important it is. And this is all about. And again, we'll talk about this more throughout the series. But don't be reinventing the wheel every time you do something. Have you know a cheat sheet or or just know exactly what you're supposed to do. And, and it also, part of the same conversation is, um, I think what we're saying about action, make it easy for people to hire you. Never let a job be held up because of you. Never let it be because you don't have to remember what's the next step. What should I be sending this person now to create interest or to create desire? Right. Have that ready so that you're always responsive and immediate. Um, and that's what a good structure will do for you. Yep. And I think yeah. we've beaten... A this dead, we've beaten Aida with a dead horse. Yes, yes. that's the expression. <laughs> yes, that's the expression. <laughs> okay, then. So now for our concluding statements, what have you been reading lately? So, what have you been reading lately? <laughs> I need to see what I've been reading lately. Well, I can answer in the meantime. I'm continuing with my series of um, ancient Greek murder mysteries because they are just so amusing and fun and cute. Um, so that's always my, my light reading. And uh, the other book I'm reading right now is on, on human bondage um, by um, Somerset Mon, and that's a name I should know how to pronounce. And it's a classic and it's this, this like his greatest work and it's a, a very, very loose and interpretive autobiography. But I confess I'm finding it a little bit heavy and I'm getting the theme of the human bondage 
in there, um, but I'm not sure that it requires quite as many hundreds of pages to bring across. But, you know, I only made that decision after I was 40% into the book, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading it through anyway. By bondage, you mean like slavery and like indentured servitude or? No, it's, um, it's and, and to, to be fair, I knew the title, but I didn't know anything about the book when I, when I started reading it. Um, but it's more about the human psyche and how we tie ourselves to other people's opinions to, to form our own and other people's life choices to, to make our own. It's about a lack of originality, really, and the fa- how, we, how we very easily become followers rather than leaders. Oh, okay. But you don't like the book? Um, I'm, I, I don't... I, I find it unnecessarily... Um, um, there are a lot of unnecessary words. Oh, yes. That, that those, way. Those, those <laughs> no, words. <laughs> it drags on at moments in ways that, that I find unnecessary. Um, mm. But with, with very pleasing prose, but um, yeah, just unnecessary. Okay. Um, very well. In the meantime, I brought up my Goodreads so I can tell you what I've been reading lately. I, uh, oh, yeah, I finished. Uh, I don't know where I, we left off with the last video, but I finished Career of Evil, which was the third uh, Robert Galbraith, a.k.a. J.K. Rowling detective uh, writer, the, the third book, which was the best so far in the series. I think... Either, I mean, yeah, this was great. So I hope she found her stride and from now on they'll keep getting better and better. But I thought this was a lot better than the other two. And, and yeah, so I enjoyed it a lot. I think you should read it and everyone else should read it as well. And in fact, it inspired me because I realized I've read all her books except Harry Potter. And I haven't seen any of the Harry Potter. So actually, I think we're going to order the first Harry Potter book and I'm going to read that. Um, at some point because I'm, I don't know, I figured I might as well. They're pretty much going to be classics anyway, so I might as well. Fair and uh, what else? I also just finished a book. Well, actually, since this is, it has to do with languages, it's called Ling- Linguistic Aspect of Taiwanese Southern Min, which I found quite interesting because it talks about, so ta- Southern Min is the, basically the dialect they speak around Fujian province close to Taiwan. Okay. And the people who came from Fujian came to Taiwan, they spoke that. Now, however, the, the way it is spoken in Taiwan is very different from the mainland. And that's due mm-hmm. to various reasons. First of all, people came from two different areas, mainly Chuenzhou and Jiangzhou, I think they're called. And so it kind of mix, these two dialects mixed. But then uh, it, Taiwan was also isolated from the mainland when the Japanese came. And so there was a lot of Japanese influence. And then also in Chiang Kai-shek, it was, it was uh, divided from the mainland, and so it kind of evolved in its own way. And then the, Taiwan had Aborigine people, Aboriginal people living here uh, when, when, they, when they came from Fujian, so it also got mixed with that anyway. So the dialect or the, Min, the Southern Min language, or Taiwanese or Fujianese, Hokkienese, it has many different names, it, uh, it evolved in its own way. And so in Taiwan, it's different from anywhere else. And I think if any of you have an interest in Taiwanese and its history or anything about it, then it's probably a good book to pick up. Um, And then what else have I been reading? Oh, I started uh, Misbehaving, The Making of Behavioral Economics by Richard Thaler. And this is for, this is actually for a book club that I'm in. But Richard Thaler, I like, he's he's one of the pioneers of behavioral economics. And um, in grad school, I read his first book, I can't, I can't even remember the name now, but I, and I really got into it, and, uh, and that's why I ended up taking a bunch of courses in behavioral economics, behavioral finance, anything I could find that was behavioral in grad school. I really got into it. And so I'm reading this book, but I think after about 10 years or so, I've had enough of behavioral economics. <laughs> and I mean, I still think it's important, but I have some issues with it, which we don't need to get into. But so far, the book is interesting, especially if you don't know about behavioral economics. This is probably the book you want to read because it goes into it from the beginning and it seems like it'll just cover what behavioral economics is all about. And uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, I just started a new Kate Burkholder murder mysteries uh-huh. uh, oh, yeah, yeah. book, which is uh, the, the, those are the Amish murder mysteries. I think I'm on book three now and in the series. And, but I just started that. So I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Cool. Um, Interesting. Where we're at. Yep. 
Okay. So that all was right. pretty much all. I hope you learned about Aida because we told you a lot about, whoa, we talked for a long time about it. And then, uh, and also about our books. So anything else to add? That's all. Okay. That's all folks. Okay.